Hello, I'm Tom Wilkinson, and welcome to the Thinking in English podcast, a podcast aimed at intermediate to advanced level English learners. If you want to travel abroad, you need a passport. But why? Why do we need these little documents to leave our own country? When was the first passport used? When did modern passports develop? What is the future of passports? Let's try to answer these questions on this episode of Thinking in English. But first, why not follow the Thinking in English Instagram page, Thinking in English podcast, or the link is in the description. And you definitely should look at my blog, thinkinginenglish.blog, for all of the transcripts and some extra bonus content. Here is today's vocabulary list. As always, the written list is available in the description of the podcast and also on my blog, thinkinginenglish.blog. Destination. Destination. The place where someone is going or where something is being sent. For example, the letter never reached its destination. Prosperity. Prosperity. The state of being successful or having a lot of money. For example, the war was followed by a period of peace and prosperity. Profit. Profit. A prophet is a person who speaks or claims to speak for God or a God. For instance, uh, Jesus is considered the prophet by Christians. To credit. To credit. To publicly acknowledge someone's role in the production or creation of something. For example, he is credited with inventing the TV. Maritime. Maritime. Maritime is an adjective that means connected with human activity at sea. For instance, Venice was once an important maritime power. To standardize. To standardize. To make things of the same type all have the same basic features. As in, phone companies should standardize their charging cables. Quirk. Quirk. A quirk is something unusual, strange or unexpected. For instance, there is a quirk in the rules that allows tax-free investment. To embed. To embed. To fix something firmly into something. For example, computer chips are now embedded into all sorts of technology. Ignorance. Ignorance. A lack of knowledge, understanding or information about something. As in, public ignorance about the disease is still a cause for concern. One of the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic is that international travel is now significantly more difficult. Most flights have been cancelled or are now running on a very reduced schedule. If you can find a flight, you also have to make sure that your destination will actually let you in. It took me almost a year to be able to get a visa to Japan, and the majority of foreign nationals still cannot enter this country. Other countries require uh, numerous COVID tests, periods of quarantine in government facilities or hotels, and confirmation of whether you have been vaccinated yet. COVID vaccination passports are likely to become a big feature of international travel in the coming years. There have been numerous debates over whether these kinds of regulations 
are fair and should be required. The second part of this episode will look at COVID passports in a little more detail. But first, these debates made me think of a more fundamental question. Why do we need passports at all? It's not something we usually question. Of course we need a passport to travel to another country. But why? Passports haven't always existed. So how did they start? And and when did they start? And why do we need them? In the modern day, passports are an essential object for foreign travel. At a basic level, They are a document including details such as your name, date of birth, address and photo. These are used to confirm your identity and the details are entered into online databases or sometimes physical databases whenever you enter or leave a country. Your passport also carries a record of where you have been and what countries you have visited. At a deeper level, Passports can symbolise freedom, be a source of national pride, allow an individual hope, safety and prosperity, and even give you protection while abroad. Passports are issued by a government and allow holders to travel under the protection of that government. Some passports allow you to freely travel to hundreds of countries while other passports make international travel complicated and expensive. The history of passports is long and complicated. While the concept of protecting travellers probably existed since the earliest kingdoms, towns and societies, the first known mention of something similar to a passport comes from the Bible. In one of the books, a prophet called Nehemiah was given letters from the king asking other leaders to protect him while travelling. British King Henry V is often credited with inventing the first modern passport in 1414. He issued safe conduct documents to both English citizens and foreign nationals allowing them to travel freely and safely. From 1540, the job of giving passports in the UK was no longer the king's responsibility, but the British government in general. This was also around the time the passport was being used to describe such documents. The word passport, that is. There There are two main theories for the origin of the word passport. One is that it comes from people passing through maritime ports. The other theory is that it comes from people passing through gates in city walls, which are known as ports in French. However, passports were not generally required for international travel until the beginning of the 20th century. And it was also at the beginning of the 20th century that truly modern and recognisable passports were developed. If you saw a passport from the beginning of the 20th century, you would probably understand what it was. The first modern British passport, so my country, um, which was uh, produced in 1914, included a photograph, a signature, and a personal description which described people's facial features. It would say things like broad forehead, big nose, small eyes. And I guess, obviously, uh, people weren't too happy with some of the descriptions. So we no longer include this on our passports. Other countries also developed modern passports at that time. And a League of Nations agreement in in 1920 caused members to standardise their documents. The League of Nations was... I guess, uh, a predecessor of the United Nations, which uh, existed before World War II. Most countries' passports tend to be quite similar, but there are some interesting quirks around the world. 
There are actually only four colours for passports. A shade of red, blue, green or black. And the majority of passports tend to be red or blue. According to some sources, the Philippines passport is the hardest passport to fake or reproduce. It has embedded computer chips, special paper that is almost impossible to copy, and other secret features. Some countries allow people to have more than one passport. For instance, I have friends who hold both British and Irish passports and British and French passports. However, many countries force their citizens to choose one passport, one country, which I think is unfair to people who may live international or multicultural lives. Now, if, if your father is from one country and your mother is from another country and you spend a lot of time in between the two countries, then why should you have to choose which country's passport you want? Passports can also be strong or weak. The stronger your passport, the more countries you can visit without visas. According to the Henley Passport Index, Japan has the strongest passport, allowing access to 193 different countries and territories. Other countries with the strongest passports include Singapore, South Korea and Germany. At the other end of the scale, Syria, Iraq and Afghanistan are considered the countries with the weakest passports. They require visas for the majority of countries in the world. However, we need to give a special mention to Israel's passport which is ranked the 23rd strongest in the world, so pretty good, but is completely refused and not accepted by about 12 countries. Moreover, Iran, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Syria and Yemen refuse to allow entry to anyone, no matter what passport, if there is evidence they travelled to Israel in the past. So, for this reason, Israel no longer stamps passports, and some countries actually issue you with multiple passports if you need to visit Israel. It is now increasingly likely that in the near future, international travel, or at least quick and convenient international travel, will require a vaccine passport. I think this is quite an unexpected future for passports, something that five or ten years ago people were never talking about. A vaccine passport will be an official document confirming that you have been vaccinated against COVID-19 and also confirming which vaccine you have used. This is because some vaccines are considered better or more trusted than others. If you have been vaccinated with China's vaccine or Russia's vaccine, for example, you may find it difficult to travel to most countries uh, in the West. However, unlike a traditional passport, the vaccine passport may also be required for attending certain events, entering certain public spaces, or participating in group activities. In some parts of the world, Music concerts and sporting events already require vaccine records or negative COVID tests. There is a lot of discussion whether vaccine passports are fair. Many people don't want to have a vaccine, and I, I've met people who don't want to have vaccines, and I have uh, tutored online people who don't want to have a vaccine. I completely disagree with them. I think everyone should be vaccinated. But does it mean that they will not be allowed to travel abroad or attend events ever again in the future? Other people cannot have vaccines due to allergies or other medical problems. Will we make exemptions for them? I think a bigger issue is the gap between rich and developing countries. While, for example, every adult in the UK has been offered the vaccine, 
and over 90% of people have been vaccinated at least once. The same is not true about other countries. Vaccines are not as accessible or easy to access in much of the world. Is it fair to stop people from entering your country if they have no chance of getting vaccinated in their hometowns? So here is today's final thought. This episode of Thinking in English has looked at the history and purpose of passports. I then briefly discussed the possibility of vaccine passports. Now, I want to end this episode with a little thought experiment. Should people who are opposed to vaccines or unable to be vaccinated be excluded from international travel and other events that might require a vaccine passport in the future? One way of trying to answer this question is by using the philosopher John Rawls concept of the veil of ignorance. The idea of the veil of ignorance is to forget everything about yourself and then try to answer the question. Answer the question as if you are ignorant, as if you don't know anything, as if you have no pre-existing thoughts or opinions. If you are morally against vaccines, you need to forget your objections before answering the question. If you are already vaccinated and very enthusiastic about it, you should also forget everything you think and feel. Then, try to think about what would be best for society as a whole. Not what is best for you personally, but what is best for, so for society in general. Imagine... I guess you're an alien. You've come from outer space. You don't know anything about this planet. You don't know anything about the history of vaccines, about medicine, about COVID, about the pandemic. If you think about the evidence that people will give you, you'll look at the scientific evidence and you consider the harm caused by the pandemic and the evidence that the vaccine is quite successful and safe. Then... I guess the vaccine passport seems quite appealing from the veil of ignorance position. It seems like it will keep society safe. But I want you to try the thought experiment yourself. Put yourself in the veil of ignorance. What do you think? Should we have vaccine passports? Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please leave a review or rating, recommend it to your friends, or let me know on Instagram. My Instagram is Thinking in English Podcast. The link should be in the description. Uh, and make sure you check out the Thinking in English blog. I love hearing from listeners, and I really appreciate all of the messages I have received over the past few months. Feel free to send me a message or... I don't know, give me some advice or recommend a topic. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.